never give in. Never, never, never. Uh, today is uh, Tuesday, the uh, 21st of January, 1997, and Ron Chisnell and John Morica are having a chat with uh, Rex Chaston at his home at Davenport School Road, Nodishaw, about uh, his service during World War II in uh, the British Resistance Organisation, as we now know it, then generally known as the Auxiliary Units GHQ, and the record is for the benefit of the 390th uh, Bomb Group uh, Memorial Museum at Parham. Oh, good morning, Rex. Um, would you like to tell us, first of all, um, about your memories in 1939 at the outbreak of war? Well, in 1939, uh, I remember the morning of the announcement on the radio of the outbreak of war. There was little else that uh, I can recall, little else that was underlined in my memory, and the interest in the Orcs units arose when the old local defence volunteers were regrouped as the Orcs, as the Home Guard and the Orcs units. One of the members of that organisation I knew well and possibly in consequence of that knowledge the gentleman became a sergeant in the Orcs unit uh, in consequence of that knowledge I was probably recruited because I understood there was an interest taken in who was recruited for fairly obvious reasons. The Saxmundham uh, unit we knew a second, although we operated from Carlton, had its operational base in Carlton in the vicinity of Vale Farm. It was constructed in a wooded incline by the Royal Engineers. It consisted of a chamber some eight foot square and probably about the same height of corrugated iron in a semicircular format the ends being bricked up with doorways in. A tunnel was almost horizontal from the edge of the incline, the bank of the ditch in fact. It was of something like 15 foot long with a stores bay midway along on as you went in the left hand side. And you went through a doorway into this chamber and then through another doorway, there were no doors of course, at the opposite end of the chamber into a vertical shaft with metal steps to provide egress from below into the woodland. And both the tunnel and the shaft were closed with counterbalanced closures some four to six inches thick, filled with soil, etc., in keeping with the surrounding terrain. Closed, they were very difficult to find and the only means of access was a small piece of wire situated near the edge of one of the, uh, the door pieces. Personnel of the unit, six at any one time, uh, covered seven men from reserved occupations and or beyond the call age limit, call up age, but one, all but one lived in Saxmundham, three of whom at one time or another occupied the capacity of sergeant and they were Charles Mandy, Fred Woolner and Edward, known as Ted Woolard, and that order while Eric Blake was corporal. The remaining three were Reginald, Rex Chaston, myself, and I'm the only surviving member, incidentally. Jack Richardson and Horace Smith were the other two. Our armament consisted of Smith and Weston's, or Colt's, .38 revolver, and a combat knife each. In addition, 
The sergeant had a Thompson submachine gun and the corporal a point three oh rifle. While in the stores there was a Sten submachine gun, the latter um, we modified so as to fire a single round. In the stores were stocks of jelly night, hand grenades, plastic explosive, detonators, phosphorus bomb bottles and lengths of three types of foods. There were always also some fire and switches. Some magnets and adhesive tape were there for making and attaching bombs to targets. A jar of rum was also part of the stores. My occupational reservation was associated with my employment and I was therefore of call up age. An odd event occurred whilst I was a member of the Orcs unit. I got a rocket from the local home guard and on reporting to their headquarters I was asked why I was not a member of one of the local defence forces. It seemed that they were unaware of the Orcs units in their midst. Our training was in guerrilla warfare, whereby, should the Germans invade, we would take to our base and operate behind their lines, relying on the local populace for s sustenance and attacking with explosive devices to destroy, at the same time replenishing our stocks from that which we took over. In this we were being trained by an army unit based on Millhouse Cranslet. This was a small unit with men drawn <coughs> from various regiments with various ranging interests who made our work very interesting. I am sure we even enjoyed our association with them. There were occasions when we got the impression that they were feeling their way in the overall plan of operations. Two of this unit remain in my memory, even after some 50 years. The sergeant, who drove their truck, with, I understand, a speed-limiting device. He drove it, keeping the speed limit pointer, indicating one mile per hour under the limit speed along highway and byway, come what may. The other fella was a fairly small-built colleague who gave every confidence of being able to extract himself from any situation, however difficult, and our morale was boosted in consequence. An early experience concerned our base when, on intelligence of a suspect German assault on our coast, we took up station, and during the night we tried to produce a cup of char. We found our primer stove was not burning well. An attempt by a colleague to ignite a lighter failed, and it dawned on us that our oxygen supply was in a bad way. A report led to the Royal Engineers coming and introducing some ventilation factor. This, in turn, led to an inspection the officers not only inspecting the work, but also the stocks on hand in our stores. It was observed that the seal on the rum jar had been broken and some of the rum was missing. This led to an inquest, the outcome of which I was never aware. I suppose I could feel regret that I never even had a taste of the rum. In training, we constructed booby traps using ordinary, everyday items such as bottles and syrup tins. We built bombs, some with magnetic mounts, devised trips and produced fire rain. You name it, we had to go. On one occasion, I was very concerned when our sergeant, on taking in fresh stocks of foods, found the colour code different from the old stock and he refused to test the new stock. This, despite we were trying to use the three types, slow burning, instantaneous and detonating, and identify each, he insisted that the odd one out be put aside. Having been trained in the, to know how to test these, I cut off short length, took home and tested it. There was, of course, some 
perhaps harmless highlights during some of our exercises. The Crawford Brace truck got stuck in Water Lane, Debenham, and the sergeant was trod on during an exercise, turning up at the fish shop with mud on his face and uniform. The silent removal of a sentry with the combat knife was aborted by a prone colleague flat on the ground nearby. A grenade throwing exercise resulted in a trainee dropping a primed grenade in the trench. Our instructors, having told us of the dangers of careless handling of grenade detonators, making points of error that would could lead to the grenade detonator exploding in our hands, then proceeded to toss the detonators to us from some distance for us to catch. At Orcs Unit Headquarters at Calls Hill House, our sergeant and myself gained a success on an exercise by planting a magnetic bomb on the assembled transport in the unit, our target that we were set. All this in spite of bright moonlight night. Our trainers, the local unit, having set an exercise for us to overcome, were at a loss to understand our possession of a map of their preparations until I told them that I had watched them from the top of a tree. At the firing practice, using head and shoulder type targets and revolvers, the targets were of the pop-up style. I put two holes through my target with a single round but failed to score. At the war end, we had some items to dispose of, and since the phosphorus could burn in air, would, or would burn in air at least, we poured it from the bottles onto some local farmland. There must have been a patch of wet soil. For the next season, the farmers ploughing the field, the field caught fire behind the plough. Hand grenades were looped together with detonating fuse and pushed down a rabbit hole. We took cover. Whilst we were aware of other units around, the whole setup was very hush hush. We were only too well aware for the need for secrecy, and other than among ourselves, our unit was, we hoped, unknown. Should operations become part of life, our lives depended on ourselves, our knowledge of the countryside, and the support of the local people. The finale of the Hawks units was a few points at the local. OK, thanks very much, Rex. That's a, a very nice summary of your time. Um, can I fill in a few of the gaps now? Um, mm -hmm. You didn't mention what your reserved occupation was in 1939-40. Well, I was in retail distribution, actually delivering paraffin and coal to the populace in the area. And what age were you in 19, uh, 1940? Well, I was born in 16. So, yeah, 24 yeah. anyway. And um, uh, how were you approached uh, to become... Were you uh, originally a member of the Home Guard and you immediately went into the auxiliary units, did you? How did they approach you? Who approached you and how did they approach you? Oh, Sergeant Manby knew me and he approached me. And um, he was the leader of the auxiliary unit? Yes, All he, the... he was the leader of the original uh, group set up. The yeah. Carlton Auxiliary Unit. Mm. And uh, so he recruited all the men uh, with, uh, of whom he had personal knowledge. You were all known to him. Uh, yes, I would say so, yes. Uh, I really can't remember how they were contacted, but I rather think he must have known them personally, yes. Did they have any vetting for you? Did you have any interviews or checks made on your character or anything? Vetting was made behind our backs. Definitely. We weren't approached. We were either told we were acceptable or we weren't, full stop. <laughs> did you have uh, a uniform issued to you? Oh, or? yeah. You did? Yeah. Uh, Ordinary Home Guard uniforms we had, except that the flash on the shoulder 
was 202 instead of the, the local home guard number. And did you wear that uniform uh, in training? Yes. Uh, and the training was at uh, Coles Hill House and, and the Mill House at Carnesford principally? No, I think principally on site. Um, you see, the training was associated with whatever the training was. If, for instance, the training was shooting, it had to be somewhere where there was a range. Um, if it was explosives, it had to be somewhere where it wasn't interfering or risk to other people. Um, our own uh, explosive experiments were done in the in the confines of the wood where we were, some distance from our uh, place, of course. But uh, I wouldn't... Coles Hill was only for a limited number. As far as I'm aware, there was only... Um, Ted and myself went there. The rest of the training, some was done at uh, Cransford, but it was usually a case of being picked up and taken out to a site. Sites which the um, unit at Cransford had, of course, used probably for other units as well as us. Now, not everybody went to Coles Hill House for the training, as you know. Uh, um, listeners will want to know that Coles Hill House was near Swindon. Uh, and then I believe you had to travel there on your own steam, either by train or by... How did you go? Do you remember? We went by train. You went by train. And did you have to report at the Highworth Post Office? I can't remember what happened at the other end. I seem to think we arrived off the train and there was a truck there that uh, we were sufficiently well known to them from either our uniform or our flash that he came and asked us who we were, we told him and uh, he took us. The Highworth Post Office formed quite a, a centre of activities for Colson House. Most of the uh, trainees went, uh, reported initially to Highworth post office mm -hmm. uh, and the postmistress then rang through mm -hmm. to uh, Coles Hill House and announced that some more of your men are here. Well, well some um, parcels are here that uh, is referred to as in uh, that uh, book of the Suffolk Secret Army. Yeah. And uh, we refer to as parcels. If you remember rightly too, the Highworth was used with a booklet called the Highworth Fertilisers. That's right. Which yes. was a secret book, I believe. Um, oh, it looked like an ordinary book of fertilizer information, but contained descriptions of fuses and explosives and timing devices inside. Yes, the I think it was circulated. I'm not sure whether it was circulated down to as low as the sergeants in the units, or whether it was merely for for reference at a unit like uh, Cranford, Millhouse. Yeah, I'm not sure. Uh, did you have any exercises with the uh, ordinary uh, members of the Home Guard when you were here? No. Kept entirely separate? Mm. No parades? No. No publicity? So secrecy was very important yes. from your point yes. of view. Yes. This must have been very difficult to uh, maintain an ordinary life by day and uh, to have to go training at weekends and at night times and uh, then go underground at times. You had a, a dual life to lead. Well... Uh... You could call it dull, I suppose, actually. It was a case of not mixing, wasn't it? Not mixing your uh, service, which was, I think we were considered to be covered by Secret Service Acts. And uh, you just didn't... I mean, you knew that your life would depend on you if you was behind the German lines. So for your own protection, you kept mum, didn't you? Let's face it. Best way to keep secret when your life's at stake, I expect. Right, yes. yeah, tell me. Now, um, the local training activities were certainly centred on uh, the mill house at Cransford, and the uh, driver of the truck that you're talking about must have been Jeff Bowery. Yeah. Uh, you know we've got some records from Jeff Bowery, and uh, he remembers those days very clearly, and driving the truck and um, he remembers the training exercises very well. Mm -hmm. And so you were in a position to confirm that uh, most of the things he's told us, anyway, pretty active training, fairly regular, uh, very intensive in some respects. Well, as I said earlier on, 
I got the impression at times that they were feeling their way as much as we were. Did they teach you a lot about explosives? Yes, they must have done. I can't think where else we would have got the information from. Um, the simplest piece of information I think that they gave us was that if you shove a detonator in a piece of this black plastic uh, explosive and shove it in somebody's cool um, dump, sooner or later something will blow up. <laughs> will. But uh, the other thing that was interesting that they uh, pointed out to us as far as explosives was concerned was the fact that if you put a stick of jelly night on the underside of a wooden seated chair, it, it when it exploded it would blow the chair into the air. But if you put a piece of this plastic stuff, the explosive factor was such, so many times greater than that, that it would blow a hole through the chair rather than lift the whole chair. That was a fairly graphic uh, description of the powers of the two explosives that we were using, or prepared to use. I think those plastic explosives you had in those days were well ahead of their time. Well, they were, because... Uh, they're up to, what well, I suppose, up to the level of the Semtex of today. Well ahead of their time, yes. sure. Oh, yeah. um, now, can we go on to the, uh, the underground hideaway that you had at Carlton? Did you know it as a bunker or as a, as a hideaway? I ask you this question because Jeff Barry insists that the Army always called them funk holes. Yes, the Army called them funk holes, but we didn't. We called them our base. So that was as simple as that. That was your base. Yeah. Yeah. Did you have an observation point as well as the main no. chamber? No. No. It depended upon the circumstances of the. Uh, of well, where we were, you wouldn't be able to uh, observe much no. because of the trees all around us. Yeah. Yeah. And you've described the two entrances, and I've got a diagram of them. Having got in the entrance that came in and out of the ditch, how high was the tunnel that you got in uh, to get into the main chamber? Somewhere in the region of five foot, I would think, five, between five and six foot. You walked along it, stooped, but you didn't. Uh, you didn't have to crawl along it. And that was supported by wooden and, and well, corrugated like pit, iron. Pit props. Pit props. Yes. And you had a single storeroom. Yes. And in that, you kept the weaponry that you've described and the explosives. What about food? That is the point. We never kept food. That's why I said that if anything happened, we would rely for sustenance on the local population. Now that differs from the experience of other auxiliary units. Well, if you wanted food, we could take it in, but there was no provision of food as such. That's very interesting. I think at Stratford St Andrew, for example, they had separate chambers for food and water and for explosives mm -hmm. and for, yes, and they had a food store and a water a, store which they rotated every month. They made a fuss of them, didn't they? <laughs> Your role was a different one from theirs, no doubt. Well, we got a water supply uh, in the form of a small river, um, which would provide a flush toilet, I suppose, up to a point. We uh, knew... Or some of us knew the personnel of the some of the surrounding properties, so I think we would have got away with it comfortably. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and we you had some training about living off the land. I mean, you would thieve stuff if oh, necessary. We knew, we knew. I mean, we uh, on exercises we used to look at the um, birds sitting in the trees and think, what a pity. <laughs> We never did actually knock any of them down. But, but uh, you would have done it. If we needed them, of course we would, yes. In action. Yeah. Yes, of course. So you're well trained and you had local knowledge. Um, the exercises, um, you, the training we've talked about, the exercises, um, did you exercise with other auxiliary units at night or did you have challenges of any kind or competitions of any kind? The relationship with other units was very, very little. Um, I can only remember having one exercise with another unit, and that was Leiston. Um, but that was uh, near the end of the period of operations, because uh, we went down to Sizal and blew up 
a tree amongst other things. Um, but that was the only time I ever remember having any contact with other units. The whole point being, of course, the fewer knew, the fewer could spill. That secrecy was critical, and one well, of, of the other, one of your other colleagues from another auxiliary unit that I've spoken to, felt very doubtful about their intelligence officer because he knew the existence of five or six auxiliary units. Yes, of course he did. And if he'd have been caught, they felt he was vulnerable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Couldn't help being, could it? I mean, it's the same you... same with the the training unit. I mean, they knew of. Um, all the units that they trained. Um, I'm not certain that they knew of the, our, the site of our OB. I don't ever remember them being associated with our actual base. We always went to them. So that did keep it a uh, reasonable degree of secrecy. It would have been very important that the, uh, if the Germans had come, that the intelligence officer and the the training uh, establishment at Millhouse, for example, had got away pretty early. Uh, Pay to vote to have them fall back with the regular army, because they were, as you say, they were a vulnerable operation. Yeah. Um, do you remember how you would have commu how your auxiliary unit would have communicated? with the army after the event of a German invasion. Do you remember what communications, uh, what, how you would have got instructions and how you would have given them information? We expected none, simply because the fighting forces would be beyond the German lines and we would be behind it. And uh, there are those who looked upon us as being simple suicide squads. Um, on the other hand, we felt we were better than they. <laughs> oh, yeah. Do you feel pretty satisfied looking back upon it that you would have been able to cause some chaos and some mayhem behind the lines? I would think so because there are two things about the German advances they always want to go a long way quick which made their uh, lines of communication very vulnerable and I think we could probably wrought havoc in it The idea of course was that we went out um, placed our booby traps, detonators, if we got the chance, if, they, if we felt there was um, troops marching, set up a, a phosphorus rain for them to walk into, um, and get back to our bunk before the thing happened, which meant that when the explosions whatever started, uh, it was too late for the defending German troops, as they would be, of course, to start looking for us. You didn't have any contact, as far as you know, by radio or through no. a radio operator with uh, Army headquarters? No. That's very interesting, yeah. yeah. There was a network of radio communications, by the way. Yes, so I understood. There that, was a uh, network. Locally, uh, it went to Thornham Magna out on the A140. There yeah. was a network, but the... For security purposes, as far as we can tell, there was only one radio operator for four or five auxiliary units mm. where it was established. Mm. Um, in your case, it probably you would have been probably totally independent. This yes. was called for a lot of initiative on your part. Well, does one has to suppose either by force of circumstances or by the fact of some degree of belief in our abilities that uh, such was the case. I mean, we uh, we felt that we would be able to do um, a number of things because we could rely on support from the local population. Yeah. Yeah. And you see, the usually, the more rural a population is, the less risk you've got of saboteurs. Local populations, I mean, even today, crime is not associated with rural populations as it is with urban populations. The same thing applied. Yeah. Yeah. Then, later on in the war, the immediate urgency of a German invasion uh, was less after they had attacked Russia and their prime source of interest was heading eastwards mm. instead of uh, towards us. Mm. 
uh, did you have to attend your underground bunker, your OB, very frequently? Did we you... didn't let up, as far as I can remember, right up till it was disbanded. Which was about, was it about 44, was it? 40, 44, I don't know. 40, four, yes, must have been 44, I think. There's a letter of Sandown in November 44, I think, oh, yeah. that was the time. <laughs> Uh, had, had you still got the Thompson machine gun, the submachine gun by then? As far as I'm aware, we we uh, continued fully armed, fully equipped, right up to the closure, yes. And when that stand down came, what happened to you all then? Well, we all met on one or two occasions, and as I indicated, our final meeting was a few jars at... Uh, the local pub. We met, I can't remember what the captain's name was now, um, but we met him out at Dennington. I'm pretty sure it was Dennington at the pub. Um, actually my most vivid memory of the fact was he stood up and done some sprouting and the uh, fellow sitting beside him Kept changing beer mugs as the as the uh, captain had a drink, set his mug down. The other bloke put his, which we got less in, and took the captain's mug. <laughs> 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 That's my most vivid memory of uh, the uh, the shutdown. But um, one of the uh, regular units came and picked up all the. Um, I think the Royal Engineers, probably. Anyway, somebody came and picked up all the equipment off us. We handed it all in. And when you went to that uh, stand-down at, uh, at Debenham, it wasn't Captain Moncrief who spoke to you, was it? Ah, yes, I suppose. Was it Moncrief? Moncrief, yeah. Uh -huh. Dennington, not Debenham. Dennington. Uh, uh, Dennington. Uh, Dennington. Dennington, yeah. Um, and were you, were you several auxiliary units taken there? Did you meet colleagues at that time? I think there was just our own unit. Was there? I think so, yes. Yeah. I think he met each unit sort of separately as we had the opportunity and could get there you see yes he was the immediate local then we had another officer based at um Crancer's mill house um was that mcintyre i think it probably was but uh, i can't be sufficiently sure to claim it he was in charge of most of the training there, most of the or much of the time anyway, Lieutenant McIntyre. Yes, well our contact really was with the with the sergeant, corporal and the yes. other bards, you see, I mean. Well, so now, the the about... officers direct, but they don't get around in the mud. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, did you have any official recognition? Did you have any letters or documents or don't remember any testimonials either. given no. to you? But you were warned about secrecy. Well, I mean, secrecy was our uh, survival. I mean, uh, that was too obvious. We didn't need to be warned about it, I didn't think. What I meant was that even after the war... Oh, well, yeah, well... you talked about it? I think we were uh, told, if I remember rightly, that it was a... It was covered by official secrets. I think that was the answer. And, uh, well, that was it. If it's covered by official secrets, it's official secrets. Most of us were old enough and ugly enough to observe that, uh, that feature. But as far as I can find out, it wasn't until 1968 that any, any knowledge became public when the book The Last Ditch was written. And then after that, uh, the subject remained quiet again. Uh, not everybody was in your position, though. Some of them didn't have their explosives recovered, as you know. I think in um, in Denji in Essex, they recovered the whole of the explosives and weapons store 20 years after the stand-down. Good Lord. Massive amount of uh, phosphorus grenades, yeah, hand grenades, yeah, yeah, Mills yeah. grenades, yeah. rounds, unbelievable amount of plastic explosives, um, thunder flashes were all recovered at Denji when somebody walked into the police station there and said, what are we going to do about all this? All this explosive. Well, I have to be honest, to the extent that I never did go and check that it was removed, I was just informed it was being removed. Yes. So it might be under the soil. I think it must have been. I mean, if not, uh, there's a little bit of danger there. But certainly the Stratford Andrew 
uh, patrol had their gear removed, but they also thought that the OB had been blown up and destroyed, but it wasn't, no, and yours no, wasn't either. No, no. That had been a waste of explosive. Well, they could have used the stuff that was in the stores, couldn't they? Yes. They liked um, now, the other thing that occurs to me is that uh, after all these years, the Ministry of Defence have uh, offered uh, surviving members of the Auxiliary Patrols the Defence Medal. Mm -hmm. uh, some men locally who have uh, have applied for it and got it, then there's one or two applications made posthumously mm -hmm. that we know of. Uh, are you thinking of applying for the Defence Medal yourself? Well, I don't really see the purpose of... Uh hanging bits of metal on ribbons. I don't think so. I mean, uh, <laughs> what does what does it do for you? To my mind, it, uh, they'd have been better if they hadn't bothered. I mean, they've left it so long that no doing it makes it ridiculous in my mind. I mean, if they sent me a five, I could go and got a drink on them. <laughs> I just wondered if maybe your family would have liked to have had it. I don't think they're any more sort of military oriented than what I am. No, no, I don't think so. Uh, so it didn't. Uh, it didn't. Uh, uh, the, the end of your time at the end of the war with the auxiliary units didn't leave you with a military feeling. Then you didn't feel uh, a no, British Legion oriented, or my whole response was thank God it's all over and let's get on with life as we should do. I mean, uh, you could argue that if you think in terms of the uh, fact that we have a Church of England, that Christianity is supposed, and I say supposed, to be the guiding principle, then slaughter, to my mind, doesn't come into Christianity comes into religion because religion has commercialised Christianity in my view.